Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you all for coming. I appreciate it. I know it's going to be a long Friday, but it's going to be a great Friday. First of all, uh, before I go into uh, how many people need to be thanked for this event to happen, I'd like to give a brief background of Wayne Law Review. Uh, this year actually marks the 60th anniversary of the Law Review here at Wayne State. We started in 1955, and we've gone on consistently every year since. We've had approximately over 1,000 alumni come through the Law Review, and currently they're practicing all over the country, in Washington, D.C., here in Michigan, on the West Coast, pretty much anywhere you can think of. However, the goals of the Law Review have remained the same from year to year. Editing at a high, very high standard, legal writing, and publishing interesting and informative academic works has been the goal of our from its inception and continues to be the main goal today. The symposium, which we hold every year, hopes to take a deeper look into one section of the law. This year, uh, Corporation Council as gatekeepers intends to look at the corporate council aspect of the law and inform everybody exactly what happens in the day-to-day -day basis of an athlete career. I'd like to thank everyone for coming. I'd like to thank specifically Judge Cohn, whose support has been tremendous. Year after year is the only reason why, honestly, this symposium happens is because of Judge Cohn. I'd also like to thank Dean Benson and the rest of the administration who have been extremely helpful in helping us plan this event and uh, have been there throughout the whole process. Professor Henning, who really spearheads this event every single year, uh, has been a huge help, and I think Justin would agree, um, in, in getting the speakers to come and having an informative event that really uh, transcends um, a regular day of school. This event really is uh, something to look forward to every year. I'd also like to thank uh, Sonia Hubbard, uh, as well as uh, Justin Zaid. Justin Zaid is a symposium editor in the Law Review this year. He's done a miraculous job, has made it very easy on the rest of the law review, and planning this symposium has pretty much taken it all on himself. So I'd like to thank you. I'd also like to thank the uh, Association of Corporate Counsel for their support in this event. It has really been tremendous as well. So uh, we also have uh, former U.S. Senator Carl Levin here. It's a great honor to have him here as well, and we thank you, Carl Senator Levin. As well as all the other panelists who are here this afternoon, Tony West is our keynote speaker. Thank you for coming. I know you had to fly out here, and you're a very busy man. As well as all the other panelists, thank you for coming. We really do appreciate spending your Friday with us. So that being said, I'd like to introduce Steve Benson, and thank you again for coming. Law Review. Thank you very much, Dennis. Uh, good morning. I'm Jocelyn Benson, the Dean of Wayne State University Law School. It's an honor to welcome all of you here today to Wayne Law, as well as this year's blockbuster star-studded Wayne Law Review Symposium. Uh, we have a great lineup of panelists and moderators today who will be discussing the evolving view of corporate counsel as gatekeepers. And you'll hear from experts in the areas of practice and academia and government, all looking at numerous issues about the emerging and evolving role of corporate counsel in the legal arena. It should be a great day of events. Uh, and as Dennis mentioned, the Wayne Law Review has done a tremendous job of pulling this together. Of course, under Dennis's leadership as Law Review Editor and our symposium editor, Justin Zaid, uh, and Professor Peter Henning, whose vision for today uh, has uh, really been a, a driving force of what we've been able, what he's been able to lead and create uh, and, uh, with our students. So Professor Henning, thank you for the tremendous amount of work, energy, and your vision for bringing us all together today. Uh, here at Wayne Law, this is uh, our, our, our dedication to the issue of corporate counsel and general counsel is reflected not just in the fact that many of our alums are serving as general counsel, of uh, leading companies today, but also that we have just recently launched a program here to place our students in corporate council offices and for-profit and non-profit businesses in and around Detroit, uh, along with a special classroom colloquium that supports the field placement experiences for these students. It's a reflection of our recognition and dedication to ensuring that our students are prepared upon graduation with experience and knowledge to do whatever they want to do with their careers, but also recognizing the important and growing role 
that corporate counsel are playing, not just in our corporate and business environment, but in the legal community generally. Uh, so I want to recognize Tim Guerrero, uh, who taught the summer's colloquium, and John Collins, who's teaching our fall colloquium, who are here today. Uh, thank you for enabling us to create this great program for our students, of which today's uh, events are another great component. So thank you as well. Uh, we're also being proud to be expanding other opportunities for hands-on learning and expanding our faculty. And joining us today is former United States Senator Carl Levin, who you'll hear from in a few moments. We're honored that after 36 years in the Senate, serving longer than anyone, any U.S. Senator from Michigan in history, that Senator Levin has joined us at Wayne Law, serving as our distinguished legislator in residence, and also chairing the Levin Center at Wayne Law. Uh, the goal of the Levin Center is to educate future attorneys, business leaders, legislators, and public servants on their role in overseeing public and private institutions and using oversight as an instrument of accountability and change. The Center is, in, in just its initial months of inception, doing incredible work to inspire and train a new generation of leaders and lawyers to embrace their responsibility to ensure public and private institutions operate with integrity, transparency, and accountability, uh, and doing, uh, reflecting much of the work that Senator Levin dedicated his career to in the Senate. So it's quite appropriate that Senator Levin also join us today as we discuss what those kinds of issues mean for attorneys who serve as corporate counsel. And of course, uh, as Dennis mentioned, none of us would be here today without the support and investment of Judge Avery Cohn. Uh, Judge Cohn uh, has uh, overseen, uh, was served as senior U.S. District Judge for the U.S. District Court for the Eastern District of Michigan. Uh, he was appointed by President Jimmy Carter in 1979, and every year this symposium is made possible through the support of the Cohn Family Endowed Fund. And certainly when we look at all of the great distinguished speakers who are here today and all the great work that went into uh, planning today's events, uh, it truly would not have been possible without the support of the Cohn Family Endowed Fund. So thank you, Judge Cohn. Uh, I'm welcoming Judge Cohn to say a few words. Judge Cohn.
world of law for what he has done courageously as a federal judge. Uh, but he, perhaps more important, personally introduced my parents, his father introduced my parents to each other. <laughs> so we have a very special relationship. Um, it's uh, great to be here uh, today to introduce Tony West. Um, he is the general counsel and the executive vice president and corporate secretary of PepsiCo, one of the largest companies uh, in this country and in the world, as a matter of fact. Not too long ago, he was a, an assistant attorney general and, so, and an associate attorney general as a, in Washington. As a, the assistant attorney general, he was head of the civil division at the uh, Department of Justice, which means that he headed up the litigation division for the Department of imagine the critical decisions which came across his desk, including a very important decision which he had to make and recommend to the president as to whether or not they would defend the Defense of Marriage Act. And that act is the one that um, made it difficult, in fact, impossible for uh, people, uh, gay people, to marry each other. And under his leadership, um, the administration decided to quit defending that act and help to lead the way to, to make it constitutionally uh, mandated that people can marry, period, no matter what their own predilections are or their own particular views are. People have a right to marriage now in this country, gay, straight, or whatever. And in part, that is due to the leadership of Tony West. And this country is always going to be dead. As Avery mentioned, uh, going after wrongdoers was also a very important part of the function of the office that Tony West led at the Department of Justice. Uh, particularly focused on the wrongdoing that uh, plunged this country into a financial crisis and obtained some of the largest settlements ever obtained against some of the banks that were involved in putting us into that financial crisis. He showed extraordinary leadership in that role as well. Today he uh, let me just mention one other thing before I conclude, and that is that I teach here, as Dean Benson mentioned, I teach at the law school. And uh, yesterday I was teaching with Alan Schenk as he's co-teaching in class uh, with me on uh, tax. And we spent a lot of time uh, in that course uh, taking a look at some of the work I did when I was chairman of the Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations, uh, where we went after uh, some significant failures and wrongdoing in this country, including by some of the major institutions in this country. And one of the things that uh, I'm afraid showed up very, very often, the failure of corporate counsel to be gatekeepers. Of what uh, we have shown uh, in Washington during those hearings and investigations and what I've now interjected into this course uh, was very sad fact that too many corporate counsel not only did not act as gatekeepers, they opened the floodgates for wrongdoing, indeed at times criminal wrongdoing by their own clients. And so the subject that you're taking on today is a subject which has huge implications for this country because we have to rely on lawyers uh, to keep our corporations and our individuals uh, on a legal path. And that's a huge responsibility. The temptations are great, including financial temptations. And those temptations need to be overcome. PepsiCo is the largest food and beverage company uh, in North America. It's one of the largest companies in the world. It has a quarter million employees. responsibility here then is great on Tony West. He is married to uh, his wife Maya, uh, is uh, an amazing attorney in her own right. Uh, 
she was the youngest person to become the dean of a law school in this country at age 29, which makes Dean Benson look middle-aged, by the way. And um, today, his wife uh, is a senior advisor uh, to Hillary Clinton. So she came home, obviously, in a pretty good mood the other night when Hillary Clinton did so well in a debate. That's the only partisan comment I'm going to make here. <laughs> Our speaker is a, uh, got his BA at Harvard, uh, his JD at Stanford, and if you can't get into Wayne Law School, I guess Stanford's <laughs> second best. Um, and uh, it's a real pleasure to introduce him. I'm uh, not going to be able to stay for his remarks, and I apologize to him for that, but uh, he said he understood that uh, it's not too unusual in the world that we live, so let me uh, introduce to Wayne Law School Thank you so much. Thank you, Senator. That's a very kind, very generous introduction. And you know, thank you for your distinguished service in the United States Senate. Uh, you served the American people so ably, so well, and we are indebted to you for 36 years of great service. Thank you. I understand uh, there's an opening for House Speaker if you're interested in that. Well, yeah. <laughs> 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 right. Well, look, let me also, uh, let me also thank you, Dean Vincent, for uh, bringing us together, for inviting me back. You know, I, this is my third time here at uh, Wayne State, and I, I always enjoy coming here and being a part of programs and speaking here. I think uh, the next time I come, I expect someone to give me a t-shirt. Uh, <laughs> Judge, Judge Stone, thank you so much. It's an honor to be here with you. Uh, thank you for what your family has done to make this possible. Uh, thank you, Dennis, at the Law, law School and the Law Review for, uh, for hosting this today. Is uh, someone uh, familiar with what it takes to, to run a law review? I, uh, I, you have my empathy and my sympathy, uh, but uh, I think you uh, uh, you appreciate as much as I did uh, what a great privilege and honor it is to, to serve in that capacity. Uh, and let me also thank um, uh, a, a good friend of mine, uh, a longtime friend, and a former teacher of mine, Peter Henning, uh, who uh, was uh, someone who uh, taught me when I was a little bit younger. Uh, and who I have always respected. Uh, I've read, uh, when I was uh, in the Department of Justice, often read his, his articles and blogs in the New York Times on, on uh, corporate, uh, corporate misfeasance. Uh, and I, uh, you know, we've known each other for more years than either of us will admit, but I certainly appreciate uh, your, your friendship and your writing here, and you're making this symposium possible. Thank you. So it is really a pleasure to be with all of, all of you today and to be a part of this uh, conversation about corporate counsel as gatekeepers uh, and the obligations and, and complications that can flow from that designation. Let me offer this disclosure now that what I'm talking about are uh, my own opinions. They should not be attributed to, to PepsiCo or to its management team or to the board of directors. The last time, and, and I just uh, let me also just recognize before I started, the U.S. Attorney Barbara McQuaid, who uh, is, is, as you all well know, I don't have to tell you what an incredibly uh, gifted attorney you have as your U.S. Attorney, someone who was a, a great colleague of mine. It's great to see you, Barbara. Uh, you know, last time I talked about the importance of gatekeepers in the corporate context, I was uh, I was wearing a very different hat than the one that I am wearing now. I was, uh, as you heard, the Associate Attorney General of the United States. It's the third ranking official at the Department of Justice. And I remember I was standing at a podium alongside then Attorney General Eric Holder in the Justice Department's press room in Washington, D.C. And we were announcing 
a major lawsuit. At the time, it was the largest lawsuit in the department's history against S&P. And we were alleging that they had issued AAA ratings to, uh, on residential mortgage-backed securities, which we believe they knew were not supported by the low quality of the mortgages that had been packaged up in those securities. And at the time, I said uh, S&P was an entity that stood in a unique position, a unique position of trust vis-a-vis -vis investors, that, that the ratings facilitated important investment decisions that affected millions. I said at the time that S&P was an important corporate gatekeeper that had failed in, in that it had allowed its better judgment to be clouded by its desire for client profits that were fueled by this overheated RMBS market. Uh, that's what I said then. You fast forward to today, a few years later, and now here I am as the general counsel of a Fortune 50 company that produces iconic global brands. I operate in a world where in-house lawyers are increasingly being viewed both within and outside of the company as gatekeepers who are charged with deterring organizational misconduct, charged with enhancing corporate integrity, charged with fostering an ethical culture as much as we are charged with being stewards, legal stewards, of the, of the enterprise, the corporate enterprise, as well as counselors, of course, to our management team. It's a world as actually the organizers of this conference have said is fraught with danger, especially for the in-house counsel that represents a single client, counsel like me. So now I, I look back on my days at that Justice Department podium, and I think to myself, who was that guy? What, what, had he no sympathy? for the predicament that I now face in the private sector. And of course, I believe everything I said then, and I think it's important that I still believe that it's important for corporate counsel to be gatekeepers. I feel incredibly fortunate to have this particular job and this particular company at this time. As you heard, PepsiCo is a very vibrant company. It's a complex multinational, uh, that multinational enterprise that is operating in over 200 co uh, countries around the world. We have about 270 employees, 270,000 employees. It's got a market cap of about 140 billion. It is a large and complex and consequential company. And I often find that there is a great similarity in the role that I had as the Associate Attorney General and the role that I'm playing now as General Counsel, both because of the diversity and the complexity of the legal and public policy challenges that I face in this job. I find that both roles are distinguished by an unrelenting yet exhilarating pace. I find that I am often grappling with multifaceted questions which can rarely be answered with reference to simply what the law says. It is a great job, and it's a great job in no small measure because of the support that I enjoy and that the entire legal function enjoys from the CEO and Renui and my business colleagues and the board of directors. Uh, you know, I think they, they understand the important contribution that the legal function makes to the value of our business, both its short-term performance and its long-term sustainability. The role of, of the in-house lawyer as gatekeeper, of course, that is actually not a self-imposed designation. We carry that distinction through a combination of statutory obligations, the unique position that we occupy within the executive suite, and our overriding fiduciary and ethical obligation to the 
corporation and its shareholders. And uh, you know, I remember when, when Sarbanes-Oxley was passed in the wake of Enron and WorldCom, I was a law firm lawyer at the time after having spent several years as a federal prosecutor. And I remember that there was a fair amount of consternation among lawyers about what imposing the role of gatekeeper would mean, would mean for the attorney-client relationship, which I think as every first-year law student knows is among the most sacrosanct of professional relationships. You know, many wondered at the time, how would attorneys balance this obligation that they had to be zealous advocates for their clients with a mandate to deter affirmatively organizational wrongdoing? How can I, lawyers would ask, be both a client's counselor as well as a corporate conduct policeman? Wouldn't that exclude corporate counsel from the very circles of trust that they needed to be in in order to detect and deter misconduct in the first place? With the prospect of in-house counsel having to cooperate with regulators, would that necessarily cast a pall over the ability of corporate counsel to, be, to become trusted advisors to the business? These, these were not unreasonable concerns at the time, and in fact, there are concerns that, that persist still as, as we've seen federal authorities, my former colleagues, in some cases myself, uh, increasingly focus on the conduct of corporate counsel, uh, coupled with heightened expectations by federal prosecutors for companies to furnish information about individual wrongdoers in order to receive cooperation credit in criminal investigations, something I'm sure uh, the U.S. Attorney will speak to a little bit later. But with, but with public trust in so many institutions, including in our corporate organizations and in our corporate leaders, with that public trust running at all-time lows, with, with the worst financial crisis since the Great Depression beginning to, just now, beginning to fade in our collective rearview mirror, and with fresh corporate scandals engulfing brands that consumers all over the world know, love, and trust, brands like GM, Toyota, Volkswagen, it does seem unsurprising that, that the expectations and the accountability that is placed on corporate counsel have only increased and intensified. And notwithstanding any of that, I will tell you that I am quite comfortable with the concept of lawyer as gatekeeper, in part because it's exactly what I expected of corporate counsel with whom I dealt when I was a Justice Department lawyer, but equally important, I'm comfortable with it because it's the way I've often thought about myself. So when I think about my service at the Justice Department, while I owe my my position there to the president who appointed me and to the attorney general who trusted and relied on me. The oath that I swore was to support and defend the Constitution, not to any individual. And when I stood in court, as I did several times, I, I said my name not on behalf of President Obama or Attorney General Holder, I said Tony West on behalf of the United States. Because notwithstanding the fact that I was uh, someone who worked with and was quite loyal to the administration that had appointed me. And notwithstanding the fact that I served at the president's pleasure, I was very clear, I was not confused that my ultimate obligation, my client, if you will, was all of you. Uh, and to the extent that I exercised any authority, I exercised that authority in your name. And it is quite similar at PepsiCo. My corporate home is in the C-suite. Uh, I live with the management. I'm a trusted counselor to the CEO and to the business colleagues with whom I work every day. I was hired by the board of directors, and I serve as their counsel. But my client, my client is the corporation, and my ultimate duty is owed 
to the shareholders who own that corporation. I am their gatekeeper. And this basic concept, who the client is, and that the client is not the CEO, it's not the business management team, but the corporation itself. This is something that I emphasize repeatedly with the lawyers who comprise my team. And it's important to keep this top of mind because in-house counsel, they constantly face the pressure of helping the business to be successful, just like our business colleagues do. Like them, we believe in our business model. Like them, we believe in our right to win in the marketplace. And we want to develop our reputation as facilitators, as, as enablers that help our business colleagues make smart, strategic uh, business decisions that will add value to the business. I often tell my in-house lawyers that it's not enough to be the technical lawyer who, who knows all of the rules yet fails to provide the guidance and judgment necessary to help the business achieve its goals. We have to be more than technicians, I said. We have to be counselors. We have to be partners. So it's essential that we, we build trust with our business colleagues because we are all in this boat together. And I believe the best in-house counsel are able to build these relationships of trust with their business colleagues such that when difficult challenges come, and they will come, the business actually seeks out the lawyer seeks out the lawyer to help the business think through those difficult challenges. So I highly encourage those types of relationships, and I try to model that in the interactions that I have with my own colleagues uh, in the executive suite. But importantly, I also tell my in-house lawyers this. You must be more than facilitators of good strategic business solutions. You must use the relationships you build with your business colleagues and the access that you forged based on the trust you've created to protect your client, the corporation. You must know how to balance being both a good business partner with safeguarding the enterprise. And that sometimes means, that sometimes means that counseling the business well, will require you to pursue and suggest alternative strategies if what, if what is being contemplated may somehow put the corporation at risk. <coughs> it means answering not just the question of can we do this, but going further to address the question of should we do this. And that means that undoubtedly, undoubtedly there will be times when the in-house counsel will find herself at a point in her career where she will be faced with the uncomfortable prospect of saying no, or pushing back, or reporting up. These two are realities of the in-house counsel as gatekeeper. And if we aren't willing to sometimes occupy that uncomfortable space, and candidly, we should not occupy this job. Now, statutory and regulatory expectations that, that attorneys report evidence of material violations or breaches of fiduciary duty by, by the company to the chief legal officer, to the CEO, as well as various Justice Department and SEC mandates outlining up the ladder reporting and whistleblower provisions. Together, all of these authorities sketch out an enforcement regime that place a great deal of responsibility on internal oversight and internal compliance. And more often than not, that responsibility sits in the wheelhouse of the general counsel. And that is both a challenge as well as an opportunity. It's a challenge because you know, we operate in an environment where the competition for limited corporate resources is intense. And uh, quite frankly, the compliance training
and the monitoring of lay personnel, especially in large multinational complex organizations that operate across international boundaries and across national cultures. That can be expensive, that can be time consuming, that can be extremely difficult under the best of circumstances. But I also believe that it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity because it's a chance to add value to the corporate enterprise. Because building an ethical culture can actually enhance the sustainability of the business by creating clear guidelines for employee behavior that create consistency, that create predictability, and that in turn fosters internal trust that is necessary for high morale and high productivity, as well as an atmosphere where doing business the right way is the only way to do business. So seizing the opportunity to build that type of corporate culture, you know, I believe that that also creates important deposits in the business's credibility account. And I think that is critical when things go wrong, as they almost inevitably will. While I was at the uh, Justice Department, one of the questions I would ask when uh, dealing with corporate misconduct was, what was the corporation's culture? What was the corporate culture in the organization? Was it a company that, that actually nurtured an ethical corporate culture and, and perhaps made a mistake or had uh, let something slip or didn't catch something that should have been caught? Or was this a recidivist? Uh, you know, someone that you've seen over and over again who two, three years ago was in your office on some other violation and for whom they may give lip service to ethics, but actually foster incentives that encourage employees to cut corners. I'll tell you, in those moments, corporate credibility matters a lot. And when you add to all of this, this reality that today we, we live in a world where the barriers to information access and communication across geographic borders is lower than at any previous time in human history. At a time when the quietest of voices can be amplified and heard in the most influential corridors of corporate power, there is increasingly a recognition that, the, that citizens, that NGOs, that communities and consumers who grant companies the social license to operate, they are increasingly demanding strong values, ethical behavior, robust compliance from corporations that exist in their social ecosystem. And I would submit to you that those companies that can demonstrate they are operating from an ethical foundation, from a foundation that fosters strong compliance, that's part of their corporate DNA, I submit to you that their social license will be renewed as they continue to build trust within that ecosystem. And those that cannot do this they will be left behind. And the reality, this reality, I think creates a competitive advantage that will reward ethical companies with long-term shareholder value. That's the opportunity. And it's an opportunity that I try to seize every day at PepsiCo, not just by helping our lawyers to keep at the top of their mind who their client is or encouraging up the ladder reporting, but also in the way that we actually are structured and administer a robust compliance and ethics structure uh, at PepsiCo. You know, every year we train our, uh, every single employee on something called the, the PepsiCo Code of Conduct, uh, on what it really means to, to do business the right way, because the idea is to instill not a, not a rules-based culture, of ethical conduct, but a values-based culture uh, in which every single employee owns a piece of that culture and feels responsibility to actually live it. And we train everybody from the most junior of frontline delivery people to the most senior member of the board of directors every single year. 
Everybody in that company gets trained on that code of conduct. And I believe all of this together contributes to this internal expectation that we, we hold and that we foster that, that in-house councils are and must be uh, gatekeepers. I think it was um, Norman Redlich, who was the dean of NYU's uh, law school, who said some 40 years ago, talked about how it was both the lawyer's burden and glory that we are expected to live by these high, unimpeachable professional standards, yet still earn a living at the same time. Uh, it's a challenge. It's a challenge not to have the luxury of, of those who can live in the temple and condemn the marketplace, nor have the luxury of possessing the single-minded imperative that, that those who for whom the marketplace is their temple that they possess. As, as lawyers, we have to live in both worlds. And we have to be trusted in both worlds. And as gatekeepers, I think that is our faith. But as much as it is our faith, I believe it is also our privilege. Thank you so much for having me this morning. In Tony's role as general counsel, he has a conference call that started 15 seconds ago. Um, so, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we will now we will now move to our uh, next panel, which is uh, a group of general counsel. Uh, so, give us just a moment to get set up.
we are going to uh, look at a variety of the concepts that were mentioned by uh, both Judge Cohn in his remarks and Tony West in his remarks. Uh, Judge Cohn talked about the three functions of corporate counsel being their duties to the organization, uh, their duties to the owners and shareholders of that organization, and their duties as uh, sworn officers of the bar, as lawyers, uh, uh, to their, in other words, their professional obligations. Uh, I think that you'll hear from each of our panel members about how they balance those obligations, those three duties that Judge Trump in the real world, in the everyday world, of actually providing counsel and services to organizations. The way we're going to try and approach this today is um, by way of an introduction. I'm going to ask each of our panel members, A, to introduce themselves. You've seen their titles and biography on your program. And spend a couple minutes talking about their individual background and reflection upon how they see their position and role within the organization they serve and work for, and how this is reflected in the structure of that organization. Do they see themselves as compliance officers, gatekeepers, advocates, counselors, business partners, or simply a head of the department? If, as is likely, you will hear from each of our panel members, it's a combination of all of those roles. I'm going to ask each of them briefly to identify the actual conflicts that they perceived and experienced in those roles and how they managed it. From there, we're going to move on to a couple very specific topics. The first being, let's talk about what sort of structures and organizational tools in-house counsel can use as they organize themselves within a legal department to maximize their three obligations that we talked about and to fulfill each of those in the best possible way. So we'll look at st structural and procedural protections that we can put in place on an organizational basis. Next, we'll look at education and training. How is it, what is the best way for those of us with that responsibility to instill that ethical culture that Tony West talked about. How do we best go about that? What kind of education, what kind of training methods do we use? The next topic we're going to touch on is law departments are like anything else. It's a huge variety. They just large 200 plus person legal departments that have all the characteristics of large law firms, segmentized, specialized organizations, to sole practitioners one person, one <coughs> or two uh, lawyers with overall responsibility for everything from antitrust to zoning and everything in between. How do we organize and look at those roles and how can a small law department offer the same sort of organizational approach and services as a large law, law, large law department? Excuse me. And then finally, we're going to look at the roles of outside counsel and inside counsel roles each should play in an environment of investigation uh, where the corporation, the entity, is at risk <coughs> due to some allegation, perception of misconduct, misbehavior. How do we balance those uh, functions between outside counsel and inside counsel? And each one of our panelists will guide us through each of those discussions. So first of all, I'd like to introduce uh, the panel from my left, your right, uh, David Jaffe, uh, who is a former general counsel of Guardian Industries uh, here in Detroit, the Bill Davis and uh, Glass and Automotive uh, Enterprise, uh, and now acting as, uh, I guess, the best way to outside general counsel uh, for hire. Um, and he will be. Uh, talking to us on topic two, uh, topic, oh, I'm sorry, topic three, education and training. Uh, 
to my immediate left, Emily Frask Rowley, uh, counsel at Ford Motor Company, responsible for environmental safety and regulatory affairs, and currently actively involved in autonomous vehicle uh, laws and regulation. To my right, David Collins, president, current president and board director of the American Bar Foundation, formerly uh, Executive Director of Corporate Compliance at General Motors and General Counsel of Saturn Corporation. And to my far right, uh, John Collins, former General Counsel and Managing Director of Alex Partners, based in Detroit, New York, a management consulting and strategic turnaround firm. So with uh, that, I'd like to start the discussion with, uh, on my left, uh, David Jaffe, Give us a little bit of your perspective, your background, the kind of role you function in as general counsel, and how you manage the varying and different roles that you play. So I, I came to being a GC from uh, Berkshire's, the Court of Appeals in the U.S. Supreme Court for Justice Rehnquist, then to the Heidemann firm here in Detroit once I was recruited uh, to Guardian. And the, the first role came from, from how I got to Guardian, which was in 1990, the, the in-house legal department was becoming a more important thing. Ben Heinemann at GE was building a prototypical uh, legal department, and the in-house lawyer was becoming the key counselor to senior management. Let me describe a situation that didn't exist 35 years ago, because the key counselor to senior management was a partner at a big law firm. Um, but as the GC became uh, involved, we, we had to be counselors. Uh, of course, as lawyers, we're advocates. Ben Heinemann at GE is an advocate for the view that the general counsel has to be the conscience of the company, and you have to be Ben. You're a teacher. We'll talk about that more later. You're a strategic partner. You're a facilitator, a defender. And people rely on you for all those things, and you're an enforcer. And there's where we get the conflict that's been the, the topic of conversation today. You're an enforcer inside because management relies on you to keep things going right, even outside the context of criminal and ethical issues. And you're an enforcer because uh, the government, to a greater or greater extent, expects you to make sure that things go right and to hand over information when it doesn't. So the terrific conflict that you've got is the need to build trust, to gain the confidence of people, to get them to tell you everything, and not to be too afraid that you're going to take everything and squash them in the ground with it. And that's a delicate balance. That's a tightrope to walk, whatever metaphor you like. It's a challenge, and it's built on your personal relationships, your people skills, your judgment in when to jump up and down, and when to count <coughs> quietly, when to speak up at a meeting, and when to wait till the meetings afterwards, and put your arm around someone and try and give them a good idea as much as it is on your knowledge of what the rules are, your judgment of when they're being broken. So that, that set of conflicts is the one that I think we all struggle with. Okay. Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, <clears throat> so I've been with Ward uh, about 20 years. Spent the first five years of that as an engineer at Ford. So it allows me to have a little bit different perspective than a lot of people that haven't maybe had the opportunity to work in part of the business. Uh, I then spent about 10 years doing product litigation. So um, we learned the litigation business and the piece of that that is one of the biggest pieces of risk that, that Ford Motor Company faces. Um, now I work in our environmental safety safety and regulatory practice, and I'm focused uh, almost exclusively on safety and regulatory. And I think maybe that's why I got invited to this panel of esteemed folks today, 
um, in that I spent a lot of time over the last few years working on internal and external investigations with NHTSA. Certainly, we really important issues for the auto industry locally to see what some companies have gone through in terms of um, scrutiny about their practices around safety. And so, um, you know, I uh, mentioned that conscience of the company, is that, is that our role? That's a, when I first started in a safety job, um, my boss said, you are now the conscience of the company with respect to safety. And I, I actually, I actually don't like that. Um, because I, that comparison. Because I think that's an important piece of what I do. But if, if our company doesn't already have the right mindset around safety and ethics, um, I, I can't be I can't be the person responsible for the entire company. And Ford is very, very lucky. We have a really great ethical mindset. Um, and so I'm merely there to help people guide them in the right way, and when I see things that are sort of going off the rails, um, do exactly what Tony said. Advise and then escalate if necessary. Um, I view my core job as giving advice about legal risk and helping my clients manage legal risk. But if that's my only contribution, I, th I think I'm selling it completely short. I'm, I'm also there as a business director, and I give business advice. And as everyone has already said, figure out a way to be a trusted business partner. I think the way that you do that is a number of ways. First of all, you have to know the law, and that's really important. You have to know the law inside and out. You have to know your business, what your business does, what its goals are, what its objectives are. You get to know your clients, people that you're working with, and you have to make sure that they know you, and they know who they can come to when they need help. And if you get all those things in line, um, I think it becomes much easier Fill that responsibility of gatekeeper and um, you know the role of corporate conscience is sort of secondary to that because if you set up a good organization and everybody's the right mentality and you have the right relationships, that all will go from that. Thank you, Emily. It struck people as a kind of odd thing that uh, the lawyers would get preeminent. They occupy the top floor of the SED and the top of the And so people would say, well, why is, why is that? Why do the lawyers are on the top floor? And the answer, uh, the, the, the most memorable answer, I still don't know what it is, but the best answer was that it was a security in anticipation, this is Cold War days. In anticipation, maybe the Soviet Union is going to launch an ICBM attack <laughs> on the United States, and you might get a direct hit from GM. And if so, big shots are safe because nothing gets past the legal standard. 
Um, I had a number of roles in GM. I, uh, at one point, I did what Emily does now. I moved through um, over a period of 31 years to a number of uh, interesting jobs. And since then, I was, I was uh, uh, general counsel of Saturn. For a time, I was uh, corporate secretary, and I finished as the uh, compliance Uh, and just as David said, uh, in those different roles, you wear lots of different hats. So I, I would say, uh, looking back on my career, and by the way, I'm now emeritus. And all this kind of stuff. Um, but I wouldn't look back and say that any one of them predominated. Uh, I would push back a little on one um, current of discussion that I'm making right here about gatekeeping. Uh, and that is that the in house lawyer, I would say, no more than the, uh, the independent or an outside firm. I went from GM to Dykema, where I GM was one of my clients. So I had both experiences. And one of my clients was Pepsi. Um, but I don't think there's a, in both, in both roles, the lawyer has a gatekeeping function, if by gatekeeping you mean um, saying, in the face of a very boneheaded business proposition, they could steer the company into serious trouble. Um, it's the lawyer's duty, whether in-house or not, to say no, to find the right way to say no. Sound the alarm. Uh, steer the company into a safer direction. I don't think that is uniquely in-house lawyer's role. Um, I do agree, though, that the lawyers in-house have not have a an advantage of, uh, compared to most independent lawyers. And that, that's because they know the company better, uh, they, they should have an easier time spotting risks, uh, they speak the language of the company, and there's a lexicon in every company. Uh, they, as Tony said, they build up trust, especially over time. This is a function that, uh, one of those rare functions that you get better at with age. As you build trust, as you develop the connections and analysis, you become better at steering the, the uh, client away from trouble and saying no to what has to be said. Uh, and also the incentives uh, are make it easier for them. We have a captive client. Independent counsel have a little more to fear. I don't think they should fear, but I do think they sometimes fear uh, the financial consequences <laughs> of giving Unwelcome advice. Uh, so, thank you. Um, I've got a little bit of a different background. As similar, I spent 20 years at Miller Key and Phil here, and then I've had two general counsel roles in my career. I've been fortunate that I moved from, uh, from Miller Key and Phil to general counsel at the Champion Enterprises in Arbor Hills, which is straight on the New York Stock Exchange, and became the GC of that company. I was there in that capacity for about 10 years. Um, so, public company that was pre sarbanes and Sox, and I'm going to come back to it later and kind of have to come back and talk a little bit about the transition, what happened as Sarbanes unfolds and stuff. And then my most recent position as general counsel, as I said earlier, a company, Alex Partners, which is a global uh, consulting firm that really focused on, created by NJ Alex in the city 35 years ago. Um, and it is uh, focused really as high risk, high stress consulting issues. And it's turnaround. Uh, restructuring issues, that kind of thing. I think it makes my job, I mean, that job interesting in this context of listening to Tony and the other speakers is, is we have an Alex Partners very complicated capital structure. Um, Alex Partners is currently controlled by a private equity firm, CBC, which in, in Europe and Asia is a huge, huge uh, uh, private equity firm. In the U.S. it's not as well known. But we have a very, very interesting capital structure. CBC owns a controlling interest. Uh, J. Alex still owns a significant equity piece and is, is very active in the company. And then the partners, for myself, included all own equity as well. And so when the question becomes, I mean, the, the classic question of who is the client and who is the shareholder, all those three uh, kind of entities have very different objectives. They mostly day to day very much aligned in terms of what they want to do and where they want to go and what the right and what the things are in the objectives and such. Um, but the roles and the duties and responsibilities, and most importantly, the 
long-term strategic objectives are not always the same. You know, private equity firms uh, are in the position of big investments, monitor them, grow them, exit them. Um, and so they have to do. And those people are meetings. Um, management has a different view. And the more they have to view about what they want to do and what they want long-term, um, where they want to go. And so my duties in that capacity, I've worked with three or four, four hats. As the general counsel of the company, I was in charge of the global legal function and complete compliance around the world. Um, I also had the role as secretary to the board. So all the governance issues that go with the board meetings, secretary the board, audit committee, corporate uh, account committee, and all those things that also fit on my paperwork. Uh, as a member of the global management committee, which is a committee of managing directors, and so that you know, gave me essentially the seat at the table, the general counsel the seat at the table for strategy and business operations for management group around the world. And then maybe most importantly, and the thing that was probably the most important job I had was the chairman of the Global Risk Management Committee for the firm. And in that capacity, I had the responsibility to look into virtually every aspect of firm operations or activities that could involve risk to the firm, not compliance. I did it on granted the illegality, so that was not a big issue. I know that's a recurring theme here, but I mean a lot of things related to what's legal, what's not, what's proper, how to handle it, for our customer relations, what our compliance issues, what our collection issues, et cetera, they all ran through the global risk management and I shared that for a number of years. <coughs> the duties and responsibilities I had would depend on which group I was talking to. When I'm talking to my partners and the managing directors in the firm, it would be you need to be a trusted advisor, we need your guidance on client issues, we need, we want ethical, we want we want integrity. We really want you to say yes all the time, which is what you can't say yes all the time. But it would depend on who you're talking to. If you're talking to the senior management staff, one you had a different interview, and of course talking to the board of directors is a very different view as well. So the conflicts that came from the role I'm in was really different, I think, than, than my co-members on the panel, stemming in part from the capital structure, in part from the fact that we had, we had a, kind of an interesting theme of a founder who had continue to be after some transactions so very intimately and beneficially involved in the company. That creates a whole different kind of a business planning uh, scenario that makes for very interesting complicated circumstances. And, and it's easy to say, um, don't forget the client is the company. Got it. Understand it. And in our class, Tim and I, I know that we talk about that regularly. Don't, don't not lose sight of who the client is. The company, what you owe to the, the duty show to the shareholders, and the judge said to the public, you can't lose sight of those either. It's very difficult. Before I'm with it, a lot of things, but I think I think one of the things that I've had good fortune to be both at Champion and at Alex Partners, and I think this is something close to some of what Emily was saying, is um, it's hard to be the conscience of the firm or the gatekeeper if you are all by yourself. If you're not coming from a company or part of a company that already has in its DNA the interest and the duty and the wants and the need to be ethical and the need to your business operations with integrity. It's much more difficult, but I've never had that issue. I've always been able to be part of and having people come to me to say, we really want to do this right. We want to be on the right side. We don't want to be close. Help us. Let's talk to have a reason with it. And again, another recurring theme that I think from David said. Um, one of the most important things I, I found from my own practice and in the roles I've had is you, uh, need to be, you need to be approachable. I found it so much easier to help you know, steer away from issues or avoid problems. If people are not afraid to come to us, if you can be talked to, they don't want to go. And that's, uh, that's really a big issue. And that's something we got to remember. There's a lot of authority to go through these roles. You got to remember how you still be approached. Thank you, everybody. The first specific topic we're going to address here as a panel, and uh, this one, initiated and led by David Collins, but all of the panel participating, is the question of structure. Any organization has a structure, has a, we keep using the term corporate DNA or corporate culture. That's a critical aspect of how a in-house counsel and legal department perform a function, as, as you've heard a couple of panelists say. We can only be effective if the organization itself 
has a desire and or a, a, a corporate commitment to that sort of appropriate ethical behavior. But as in any organization, structure and context means a lot. So I've asked the panel to think about what is the ideal way to structure a legal department within an organization so as to promote a the management and resolution of all the various conflicts that you have heard people describe, heard the panel describe, and to assure that the in-house lawyer is can be the most effective in managing the responsibilities to the organization, to the owners, to his or her duties as a lawyer, and to other various constituencies that form or are part of that organization. So Dave is going to lead that discussion uh, for about 10 minutes, and the other panelists will chip in with their views as we go through. Dave. Thank you, Tim. Um, I mentioned uh, that I finished my career uh, at GM in 2007 um, as the director of the corporate compliance program. We, we, we reformed the compliance program uh, in recognition of some legal changes certainly before then. Uh, and I want to address the structural issue by reference to the role I played uh, in that capacity. And I want to, uh, I hope particularly to Oh, some pushback, maybe from Emily, but, but from any of you. Um, I performed the corporate compliance function uh, as a member of the legal staff. Uh, I reported to the general counsel in that capacity. Uh, and, my, and the proposition I would, and I think I did well, I think we, we created a good corporate compliance program. The proposition I, I'd offer for a debate, and I know it's debatable, it's not a new question. I would offer the suggestion that the function should not be housed, the corporate compliance function should not be housed with the legal staff. It ought to be housed somewhere else. It can't work without lawyers, so lawyers have to participate, but I would, I would suggest that, that more appropriate home for it, either in the audit department or in standalone function, or, or perhaps even in quality control. I remember suggesting that the quality control mindset lends itself to uh, compliance oversight very nicely, to fit in very close. Um, and instead, a lot of corporations, including when I was there at uh, GM, uh, house it and said it. In addressing why I think that's a problem, a structural problem, let's start with what we mean by compliance. Uh, I broke in as a young lawyer and I moved through all these jobs, as, as my fellow panelists said, all the while, long time ago, he's advising me. And the advice, the common thread was here for what you need to avoid doing to, uh, to, to stay clear of the legal violations. I also think, well, that's compliance. Comply with the law. That's what lawyers do day in and day out. It's nothing new about it. We've always done it. But when we use the word compliance, I think we all use it in a similar sense. Now, we're not talking about that. Um, that still exists as, a, as, a, as an imperative or legal advice, but a compliance, it, it, as we use the word in connection with the compliance program, means something different. What it means in, in, in more recent parlance is a system of effort. It's, uh, <clears throat> there's always been consequences for failing, for violating the law. That's their still of course. But in, in, in recent years, I would say the last 15 years, uh, there's grown up a body of law, I call it the law of effort, that attaches consequences <coughs> to the failure of a company to, uh, to attempt adequately there's a law of effort. And when you fail to meet the requirements of law of effort, uh, problems arise that, that didn't used to arise when, when, uh, when outside scrutiny and audit committee scrutiny didn't focus so much on 
efforts. Uh, so uh, let me examine, for example, how this law of effort works. If we could go on for, we could have a full day on this more. But here's what an adequate effort would have to look like. Uh, I'll pose it as a series of questions. A good system of effort would answer yes uh, to each of these questions. And, and there are subsets to the questions to drill down to each of the latter area of inquiry all by itself. But, and remember, this would apply to every legal duty in the corporation. Uh, and that's a lot of legal duties in a complex corporation. Uh, is there an identifiable person in charge of meeting the legal duty? There has to be that. Has that person, and it might be a team, Identified the legal duties uh, that have to be there. Have those requirements, legal requirements, been translated into actionable steps that employees can follow? Do's and don'ts, maybe it's product standards, if that's what it takes to be legal. But there has to be a translation from the legal language to actionable behavior. Uh, and you have to have a lawyer. Are employees trained in those do's and don'ts? Are employees encouraged to report violations? Uh, and are they protected from retaliation when they do report violations? Uh, do the hiring process and the selection process, promotion process, screen out violators, especially from this oversight? They certainly don't want bad actors in charge. Um, this is a greatly simplified list of questions. <laughs> it, but generally, if you do all those things properly, uh, then you have passed the law of effort. If you don't, if you don't have those attributes in your effort, then those deficiencies have to be flagged and they have to be fixed. And all of this has to get reported to the audit committee of a publicly traded company. To be listed on the New York Stock Exchange, the company's audit committee must have in its charters that it uh, assists the full board in meeting its, uh, in overseeing the company's compliance with legal and regulatory requirements. Not some, not just that CPA, not the big ones, not just the insider code, everything. So this is a big job and the audit committee has to pay attention. So why do I say that the lawyer is the wrong person to head up that, that system? Auditing and reporting. The reason is, a reason, or one reason maybe is that the lawyers don't have the minds to this. But a, a oh, I think I did. <laughs> but um, the problem is that with all, of all these legal duties, some of the compliance responsibilities or some categories of legal duty are assigned to the legal. Pre-bankruptcy, when I was at FGM, that was true of advertising law and, and inside quite much of the social uh, Other major areas of legal duty uh, had, had a home in, say, OSHA was in the manufacturing sector. Uh, there was a dedicated tax area for tax duties. But some of the duties are on their home. Now, I don't think I ever ran into, into trouble uh, as sort of the auditor of how well these functions are working in their time. When the person I'm auditing reports to the same boss that I report to. But I think it's an appearance issue. And I would argue that for appearances sake, and maybe for skill set purposes, I would find it different. Let the lawyers support some other function.
partial ownership change seen it transition so we get a separate uh, Department of Compliance and Ethics which reported to the CEO. Um, the challenge is where does the Compliance and Ethics Department get its legal advice? So as much as there may be a conflict or an appearance of conflict, if the Compliance and Ethics people and auditors who are often not lawyers report up to the GC, you have another one where the head of compliance all of a sudden wants her own lawyer. And what's the relationship of that lawyer to the GC and who gives legal advice to the company and who's the arbiter of where the law is and the risk manager, as David was saying, in this situation. So if you define compliance, the compliance function narrowly, as you did David, and it's the auditing and uh, keeping track of and uh, making sure incentives are in place to encourage people to speak up and to punish them if they don't, then I can see. But, but there's another part of the compliance effort, effort which is to keeping people um, focused on their legal and ethical obligations, and I think it is very hard to separate that. Uh, I, I agree that lawyers have to be a part of this. Um, they have to inform them. For example, identifying a legal belief, you can't do that. So lawyers fit in the program, but they shouldn't have anything. And I think the, the point I would add to this is that the structure you described, David, I think falls in the category of resource efficiency. In other words, a large Fortune 500 publicly traded company probably has the luxury or at least resources to create a separate organization that has its own structure in place within the overall organization. Most small or medium-sized enterprises, certainly the organization with which I was associated, did not have that luxury. So when you were looking to find a place, a home for these functions, it really came down to two things. It was either in the finance area, through the audit, or it was legal. Uh, there was no other organization, even the quality organization, in, the, in our particular company that was suitable. So uh, given the fact that so much of compliance uh, dealt with the financial functions of the company and that the internal audit group already had a very large and key role there, it sort of by default in our organization felt illegal simply because we were the organization that had the skill set and the mindset to do it within the, organi within the organization's I would agree with that, and I think we uh, similarly ended up not having a separate, we have a separate compliance function, but the GC's office working closely with the internal audit that is kind of what we end up seeing kind of thing because of the resources that kind of thing. So team, team uh, you know, kind of co-head, a co-region, and then anytime you get, if one of my partners would say, you want to starve a dog with only three people to feed it. So we've got, um, got co-head, you're not sure who's responsible, but given you know, the resources that's great, you've got to have that. David, what is, uh, and you, you touched upon it in, in your discussion of who reports to whom. Um, is the view of the panel that whoever is head of what is called compliance and whatever that may entail with any given organization reports to whom? The general counsel, the CEO, the board? Uh, how do you see the specific structure as being a key element of deconfliction. Well, I can use a new word that was just uh, put together by John Kerry. Whoever that person reports to, that person has to have direct, uh, direct access to the CEO, the board, the chair of the board, the chair of the audit committee. So whatever the reporting relationship is, that just as a general counsel may report to a CEO, or in a few cases to a CFO, the general counsel needs direct access to the board without going through the CEO. Right? So I think what the reporting line is, is is perhaps less important than the clarity of the access, the 
that that person has to go directly to ultimate decision makers when there's a problem that isn't being addressed. Okay, I want to hit on, catch on two things, Tim, that David said, the, the, the topics. That is the change in the role and the stature of the general counsel. And I think it's tied in part to something you pointed to me about who the GC reports to. It's not that, it was not that uncommon years ago that the GC would report to the CFO, the general counsel, or even in some cases to the chief administrative officer or something. And as the world has changed, that role has changed, it is, it is almost, I don't know, say uniform or universal, but the general counsel reports to the CEO now. That reflects the change in that role and the act, the, uh, I think the ability to have an influence that is much more important than it was in years gone by. And that, that reporting, I think, has has had an impact. So I know some of you had your hands up. We're gonna we're gonna take questions as a, as a whole uh, in the last ten minutes. Uh, so please save. Okay, moving on to our next topic, uh, education and training of the organization. How does the general counsel uh, in-house lawyer best educate and train the organization which she represents regarding regulatory and legal compliance, reporting requirements, risk management, and the importance of corporate citizenship? What is the necessary audience within an organization for this effort? What role does the board and senior management play in this effort, and what conflicts, if any, can arise through the process of education and enforcement? And David Jaffe is going to lead us out on this topic. David, I'll start with a quick story. As General Counsel of Guardian, I went off to India to meet with the uh, chairman of the board of the joint venture, in which we were a 50 50 partner. India had just passed an antitrust law which was about to come into effect. And I was to explain to the uh, chairman and to the board and to the sales team of the joint venture partner uh, why, what, what competition law or antitrust was, why they had to take it seriously, why they had to obey it. And um, we can talk all day long about the ethical standards of the organization and the CEO and you hear people in our place and say, oh, we're, Tony, David, we're, we're glad that we work for a highly ethical company. When you get out in the field, it becomes complicated. I'll talk about that a little bit because it is a challenge to educate and train and it's a challenge to educate and train while you have to be an enforcer. And we can maybe think about three different things that we have to educate and train. We have to educate and train on what the rules are. Okay, well, what are you supposed to do? What are you not supposed to do? Um, we have to educate and train on the values of the company, as, as Tony and others have said today, and, and what kind of standard of conduct the company expects. And we critically need to educate and train on how an employee, whether it's secretary in the C-suite, or a shop assistant, assistant purchasing manager in India, uh, responds if they have a question or perceive a problem about an ethical or legal issue. When we teach rules, we, we lawyers have some challenge. It's a challenge to teach rules because we are extremely good at making things complicated, while the people out in the company need to have it simple. And yes, the law is often complicated, but the people who have to follow it will not come here to the Wayne State University Law School in order to do their job as an assistant purchasing manager. Um, it's a challenge to teach rules because the efficient approach, online training, is not very good at, at delivering actual understanding, especially across languages and cultures. And it's even more significant a sense of urgency and the importance to which the company attaches to this thing. And it's a challenge to teach rules because we as advocates, wearing that hat, we want to give the company latitude to do as much as possible. And sometimes that's just not possible for people to absorb the fine lines that we've got and would be better teaching a rule that's more restrictive. Try to explain, for those of you who are familiar with the FCPA, the rules on facilitating payments to a purchasing clerk in Saudi Arabia. It's not very easy to do. It might be better just to say we're not going to make those payments, even though American law permits them. We need training that's as clear, as personalized, and as in-person as it can be. <clears throat> a 
it's even more of a challenge to teach what the company expects, because that's something we can't do alone. It's your question, Jim, about the role of CEO and board and senior leadership. Now, there's been a lot of discussion lately. You've seen it in the press. Judge Cohn mentioned it about Volkswagen. There's a lot of discussion whether the CEOs of Volkswagen, Peach and then Wintercorn, knew about the software that their engineers had invented to cheat on emissions tests. Maybe they did, maybe they didn't. But there's absolutely no doubt that the engineers who invented that software and put it in place did not know, did not believe that their CEOs expected them to act with integrity. The most important, in my experience out in real life, are people who occasionally screwed up. And maybe the only important determinant of how an employee will act when there's an opportunity for wrongdoing is how that employee perceives his or her immediate boss's expectations. That's what people respond to first and foremost. And we lawyers will never convince them that the boss has high expectations if they see evidence to the contrary in their daily work and their daily interactions with their boss. We can write codes of conduct, we can teach classes, we can transmit splendid tone at the top videos with the CEO mouthing all the right words into every employee's computer, phone, and telescreen. Don't well, ask for those who've been in-house lawyers in the room. How many of you walk, have walked into a room where a meeting's assembled, and as you enter, a senior business person in the room will say, "Okay, stop talking now. Leave us here." <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, how do you go to that person and say, "You can't do that. Do you understand what you're undermining when you do that?" In that situation, does anyone wonder that no one out in the field cares what some suit from compliance or legal has to say about what you ought to do? So our most critical teaching tasks, as the guardians in whatever jargon you want to put on it, of ethical conduct, are to convince the top several layers of management to truly expect that their direct reports act lawfully and with integrity, and to convey that in their day-to-day -day interactions. We need to teach them to convey that expectation clearly. We need to convey them to teach them to convey that expectation unhesitatingly. And we need to teach them to convey that expectation to everyone, especially to top performers, who sometimes in organizations get a little slack. And the only tool for this teaching that I've seen succeed is intensive one-on-one and small group conversation starting at the top and working down several layers. That is what moves the level of compliance within a company, is getting bosses to convey the expectation that quality, integrity, compliant behavior is what's expected and that the business consequences for that employee will be real. <coughs> now, if we succeed in conveying those expectations, we still need to teach people what to do if they see a problem. Or more importantly, better, if they see something that might be a problem that they're not sure about. Because when someone asks a question, that's the best teaching opportunity of all, right? You know you've got them engaged because they're asking the question. We need people to speak up, to call the right person, to ask that question at the earliest possible moment, so that instead of dealing with Barb McQuaid over there and her colleagues about how good a compliance program we had and how we did our best to prevent this thing, we never deal with them at all because we did prevent it. An employee who speaks up when she hears someone talking about paying the bribe is ever so much more helpful than an employee who speaks up when he's noticed that a bribe has been paid. We need them to ask a question when they're not sure. The sentencing guidelines are the source of this law of effort that we're hearing about, requires 
A system whereby employees may report or seek guidance regarding potential or actual criminal conduct without fear of retaliation. Now, it's all very nice if they may report it. That's what's technically required. So there's a hotline and they may report it. That's terrific. Um, we need a culture in which they will report, in which they will ask questions. We need that to be compliant. We need that to meet the ethical standard that our senior managers and our board will generally say they want to keep. And we need it to keep their little butts out of the sling. To achieve this, we need to overcome two natural tendencies in one institutional problem. We need to overcome people's desire not to be or to be perceived as snitches. We need to overcome people's fear that if they make a report or even ask a question, they'll in one way or another be blamed and punished, directly or indirectly, and outcast in the sales team, not getting the leads, whatever it is. And we need to overcome the conflict in our roles as educators and enforcers which makes it our job to ensure that sanctions exist within the company and to inform the government of wrongdoing and of the individuals involved in them. As Leslie Caldwell, the AA chief of the criminal division and her colleagues have been emphasizing in speeches over and over this year. So what does that mean in reality? What's the teaching thing we've got to do? Unless the individual employee believes that the risk of something bad happening to you for speaking up is much smaller than the risk of letting something bad go on, we're not going to succeed. We're going to need to work with business leaders to avoid building a compliance culture that's overwhelmingly driven by fear. Because if we do that, people will clam up. We'll need to work with the Justice Department in the context of its insistence that companies provide full information on the conduct of individuals to find ways to permit corporate counsel to support and defend, even though they're not our clients, employees who are the ones who speak up and enable the company to detect criminal conduct and prevent it from continuing or spreading. Because the experience of facing the power of the criminal justice system in the Department of Justice and being interviewed by the FBI is an intense and overwhelming experience. And what we can't have is a situation where as soon as someone is close to, and I'm not suggesting that this is what the Department of Justice expects, it's something we need to guard about against. If someone, as soon as they are close to a problem, is cast to the to the wolves in their perception and in the perception of their fellow employees and set up to take their own risks, we will not get employees to speak up for us. So that's a teaching challenge we've got. Any other comments from the panel? I have, I have one. Um, I think I, I would describe what you had talked about here as sort of the, almost as a hearts and minds approach, convincing through various means uh, folks in an organization to basically do the right thing. If we look at, uh, in another context, say Sarbanes-Oxley, and in the financial reporting context where CEOs and CFOs are required to execute certifications about the accuracy and completeness of their financial reporting <coughs> on a quarterly basis. And I've seen the steps that organizations take to allow a CFO and a CEO to do that by basically driving that requirement right down to the accounting personnel at a particular facility. Everybody is signing up, right? If we did that, would you advocate that something similar to that be in place for the general uh, code of conduct? In other words, everyone has to certify in writing on a periodic basis, annually, whatever, that neither I nor anyone reporting to me has done anything in violation of our code of conduct as a way of uh, driving the sort of behavior, the do the right thing behavior that you described? No, because um, I don't think signing things every year conveys a whole lot of meaning in real life. Mm. It is 
good to have a record when there's some, it, it may be helpful to have a record, and it may help people at various levels I'm demonstrate sure boss behaves in a certain way or doesn't behave. Maybe, but I don't think signing things is what does that. I, I just it's, know there's a lot of that going on. It happens, and, so. it, and it may be necessary to do in many circumstances, but I don't believe it's what will drive behavior. It, it's sort of the culture, that there, there's a part of the culture of compliance that says if you have the documented effort and the paper in place, you've done the job. And I think what you're suggesting is that <coughs> We have to document that we've done the job because we will have, it's not enough to have done the job, we will have to demonstrate to someone skeptical in Tony West's situation who's going to, you heard him say, he wants to know what we're like. We can't just say that we were, we're going to have to have paper of some sort to do it. But the, that shouldn't be confused with the doing of it. Thank you. Oh, sure. Connor, I agree. Um, there's one of that echo. You know, training is really important. I actually do probably close to 100 training sessions a year throughout the company. I always finish with the slide that says, anger management believes in this. They take it seriously, and here's how I can prove it to you. And it shows on, um, you know, excerpts from our filters are the right way, and what our company management has said about how important it is to follow the law, meet our ethical obligations. But I did just want to add, comment that it's easy for about 25% of what I do, which is black letter law, what does the law say, and how do you comply and how do you not comply. The other 75% is much more difficult. How do you design a product so that a jury sitting in South Texas after a horrible accident has happened to someone is not going to hold your company liable for some horrible action? I don't have black letter law that I can train people on. It's more in the area of legal awareness, telling them what the risk is highlighting the issues for them, and not training them to solve them, to say, this is the time when I need to raise my hand and go ask for help. That's the really hard part of the training. Yeah, thank you. Our next topic, and we've touched on it briefly, but we'll visit it in more depth. Is there necessarily a difference between the approach to compliance and the role of the House Council between large legal organizations with large legal staffs? And resources and organizations with smaller or even non-existent in-house legal staff. And guiding us through this topic, uh, John Collins. Tim, thanks. The, uh, again, we've, we've touched on some of these topics already, and I think the, the flavor of the view of the candle is probably pretty clear. Um, I don't think the size of the company or the size of the legal staff really is a driving force for compliance or, or you know, risk. Uh, it really is much more a cultural concept. Um, and, and in my circumstances, I've had, uh, and as Tony said, right, as Tony said earlier, it's all about what's the DNA of the company, what's the culture of the company. Um, there are probably three factors I think the company plays significantly. Uh, as what as Dan said earlier, we call these days kind of what happens, totally at the top, but really what, what's your CEO and what's your board saying, and not just saying, but actually doing it. I think geography has a lot to do with it. It's going to touch on earlier. Um, when, when I got to, uh, a couple of thoughts on that, so when I got to Champion Enterprises, it, it was in the pre sarbanes Oxley days, um, the CEO and the chair was kind of walking around, who really did, at that time, set the tone at the top. He had in place already, he had operations across the U.S. and Canada and the U.K. in the modern manufactured housing business, all the way through retail, finance, transportation, uh, uh, every part of the, the development had established pre sarbanes actually a fully independent board. He was the only company member on the board, fully independent, fully independent audit committee, uh, fully independent comp committee, corporate governance guidelines. He was fully all about full disclosure, complete transparency, and, and, and everybody in the company got it. They understood that really, really clearly. So I, it wasn't where my job was to kind of create that environment. My job was to foster it, accept it, continue to enhance it, everything I could to take what was already in place, a very good and a compliance to the board and transparency organized organization and move forward. And that helped a lot in terms of securities, fraud allegations. Uh, we had a treasurer for one time at Starbase uh, reported a whistleblower scheme on some issues. He thought the financials were wrong. But it was really clear that it wasn't lip service. It was an absolute demand and expectation 
expectation for all compliance at every step that is started by the CEO and the chairman of the board. Great, great organization. Alex Parker is very much the same way in terms of compliance and risk of legal. Same thing, lots of visibility, um, support. And again, as Tony said, the, you know, the, that, that's a, coming from your CEO, every CEO, I believe they all say, yeah, I'm all about compliance, I'm all about enforcement, I'm all about human rights. But then you gotta say, okay, what, what actually happens? Talk to talk and walk to walk, as they would say. And again, members of the field organizations would say, hey, look, we wanna get compliance, risk, and legal front and center at every company, at the county, at the event, at the time the partners get together, we wanna get full visibility. Um, and again, I, I do wanna to touch on something I made earlier, point I made earlier, and, and David said it before. With the role of general counsel comes a huge amount of authority and responsibility. And it is so much easier, so much better for the organization, for the shareholders, for the public, all the stakeholders who are interested if you have established a um, function that is approachable. It's so much easier to have the questions, as David was saying earlier, to have the questions asked at a time when you can shape the result or, or deflect or change, change the outcome, change where you're headed, make such a difference. And that's not that easy. Some of the business people that I've dealt with said, hey, you just tell them. You're the general counsel. Here's how we're going to do it. It doesn't work that way. And it really, in my own experience, it doesn't work that way because you've got to be having a, I um, want to say non-judgmental, you've got to have a dialogue with people who know they can approach you and ask the questions and, and seek advice and guidance at the right time in the process. I think most of the people that I've worked with have worked with before, they don't want to be in the wrong side of the law. They don't want to be on the wrong side of the issues, but they do sometimes get close and want to know help me. I need, I need a view. And, and also something Tim and I have talked about before, that is I need a view. It's not going to be an independent view, because I'm not independent. I'm an employee of the company. I'm not independent. But they do need an objective. They need a view that can step back a little bit from the business expertise, from the pressure of the day, and say, let me help you a little bit. I mean, you've got, I'm not independent in the sense of Expectations of general counsels, certainly by at least the U.S. Justice Department, the federal and the requirements of the federal sentencing guidelines. Is there ever a scenario involving a criminal or civil investigation which could involve significant economic fines or even incarceration of individuals where a general counsel would not immediately outsource the entire internal investigatory exercise to outside counsel. In other words, at what point does the fact that a general counsel is part of the organization, is internal to the organization, become a handicap or become a liability in terms of attorney client privilege or in other, in other ways uh, uh, diminish the ability of the organization to defend itself and or survive appropriately an investigation or a crisis of, of that nature. Uh, and generally, what is the appropriate relationship between an internal legal organization and its external legal advisors in these situations? And for that, uh, Edward's going to take us through that discussion. Thank you. I just want to start by saying these views do not necessarily reflect the view of my general counsel. <laughs> I need him to speak to that himself. But I, I think you have to look at every situation uniquely. The facts and circumstances are all going to be different. If you're in a situation where there's some suggestion or inference that someone on the legal staff has a significant role to play in whatever it is that has gone wrong, I think that's a time when you probably would need to say, we're going to step back and let somebody external handle this because we don't want to have any error of propriety. Um, and there's certainly benefit to having a third party do that investigation, particularly if they conclude that there was a problem and that everything's okay, and you get to that endorsement. But, um, and not a, not a ding to our outside counsel um, or, or outside law firms, but for 
an automotive manufacturer, our business is incredibly complex. And the knowing the business piece of it is really important to being able to do an effective investigation. So people that are outside of that organization might not always have um, all of the insight and the knowledge that's going to let them do an investigation in an effective way. But I think that's a really important time to just work together with um, externally and internally. Define roles, who's doing what, who's in charge, who gets to you know, ask questions and who gets to do different things. I think if you define the roles properly, I think you can have a, a, a joint relationship which will ultimately come out with better um, results in the end in terms of uh, analysis. But the other thing, just pragmatically speaking, a lot of employees um, are used to dealing with in house lawyers. They know them, they trust them, they have relationships with them. And just you know, you're doing witness interviews and you stick them in a room with someone from outside the company, I don't think you're always going to get the most forthcoming answers. You might have a better chance of actually finding out what happened. If you can either do that collaboratively, or you can have that conversation beforehand that says, this is what this person's here to do. You should tell them everything. You should tell them truthfully everything they want to know. And it's OK. Go ahead and talk to them. Um, I think that kind of collaboration um, will get where you know, get to the answers more effectively than just hiring a third party to come in to parachute in and do all sorts of work. Seldom would hand a matter over to them, but it's important to engage outside counsel and to let them know in writing that part of their task is to observe the inside counsel, and if they see any hint that inside counsel is not completely aggressive, is missing something, is trying to protect someone in the company, that they are to go to the GC and, if necessary, to the CEO or the board. Because there is a concern that's been clearly expressed in the Justice Department and in other agencies that inside counsel sometimes uh, don't rush to the bottom. That some inside counsel are protective beyond uh, just their role of being uh, good advocates. And so having that record of someone there to um, 
to watch and make sure is, I think, very useful in giving them some actual authority. But I agree with Emily that you will often get much more information if you are there, and I've, I've done it, flown to Dubai to convey both the importance that senior management plays to the investigation and that personal relationship to try and get truth while having outside accounts to do it. And the other piece is to, as, as David said, to conserve resources. You don't want to. What I've, what I've seen sometimes, one time, where inside counsel was hired, is that they all of a sudden became the most conservative lawyers in the entire universe. And we threw away vast buckets of money on what turned out to be nothing. Because when you just toss it over the feds, they have a license to put it through any machine they want. And you can come up with all sorts of scare stories. So you got to try to balance these things. Um, we're running up against your time. I know. Uh, just a quick uh, comment and then a question. Uh, you were talking about, um, what, oh, sorry. Quick, quick comment and then a question. That, um, comment has to do with, we were talking about signing every year the employee conduct that I read or the no problem with it. Um, every, everything I've learned is that a paper program is okay, but that's more uh, the, the tone at the top and the message that conveys, uh, that, like uh, what the John was talking about, the tone at the top. Uh, and, and the example I'm always given is that Enron had a great paper program. It didn't have much in terms of uh, what actually message was to be on the tone of the company. Uh, but my question has to do with uh, the very first topic that was discussed. Uh, David Collins was talking about whether uh, compliance and ethics should be housed within legal. Uh, and I think the reason you gave that it shouldn't is that uh, the gatekeeper shouldn't be the, the people that actually own the issue. Uh, and, and the examples you gave were uh, insider trading and advertising. And so I guess my question is whether there's other uh, examples you can come up with for companies that are not publicly traded companies or that don't have advertising issues. Exam examples of where the um, responsibility for, for compliance would reside, necessarily reside in legal? Right, that the compliance department wouldn't be within legal, we may be an audit because legal has some responsibility for certain functions. We were talking about advertising. Yeah, the, the, uh, the two examples I gave, uh, advertising and insider trading, just happened at the time I was responsible for this <coughs> compliance auditing activity. Uh, they, they happened to reside at the legal staff. Earlier in my career, GM had a standalone um, compliance function for advertising that was outside the legal staff. So these things change. But my concern arises when, at, in the particular case, the legal activity, the compliance activity, either by default or for some other reason, lands at the legal staff. And I think it could, it's idiosyncratic. I mean, it could be, it could, it could, there would be one set of legal duties in company A and another set in company B. Uh, but when compliance, the compliance program's job is to grade activity. Uh, you, you really don't want, I think ideally you wouldn't want uh, to be grading your own papers as, as the general counsel's organization. That's why I moved out. I what the legal duty is. If, if, again, it's a resource issue here. But, uh, it's, what I've described works much better in a big company than in a small one. And I don't mean to suggest that the resource issue, you know, all pants have most correct clients. It's just how they're going to be. I hate to cut off Mark Gold, but we do have a break coming up and it's been going for two hours. So I'll play Italian dictator and say that. Peter, thank you for that welcome opportunity to uh, end this. I want to thank the panel. Thank you all of you. <laughs> we will take a short break. We'll reconvene about 11.30 or thereabouts. There's coffee and bathrooms, so things like that. Thank you.